All right, well, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we get into the Word of God today so you can go out and enjoy that beautiful day, all right? Would you join with me? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Would you just bow your heads and let's just prepare for God to speak to each and every one of us in this place. Father, we thank you for this house. Lord, we thank you that we get to come into this place to enjoy the comforts of, of church, Lord, the, 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 the comforts of singing and sound systems and air conditioning. Lord, we thank you that we get to gather together a like-minded faith and to hear your word, Father, to hear you speak to us. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or from a woman, to hear from the old or from the young. We come to hear from you, and we acknowledge that at the rock, it's Jesus that's our senior leader. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit today would be our counselor, would be our guidance, lead us, direct us, show us in your word what you would have for us to see, have for us to do, so that we walk out of this place and live fully into your will and your desires for our lives. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with here at this church, and we ask that you'd bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. We give you that praise. We give you that glory. Thank you that you would accomplish your will on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said... Amen. Well, if you weren't here with us last week, we had a monumental week last week. Why? Because for the first time in 18 months, we got through Hebrews chapter 11. So if you would, turn in your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 12. Wow, six years through the book of Hebrews. And here we are, Hebrews chapter 12. Two, two more chapters to go. So, you know, plan on maybe another six more. Just kidding. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number one is what we're going to look at. We talked about the subject of running the race last week, if you weren't with us. Last week, we just learned that there's a great encouragement for you and I. And that is that, not that heaven is watching or spectating your life, as we saw that there's this great cloud of witnesses that watch us. But rather, it's an encouragement. It's a motivation that the, the, the metaphor or the, the imagery that is painted in Hebrews is that you and I are set up to run this race that God has set before us. And there's not this grandstand of, of people watching and the pressure of people watching, but rather it's a grandstand and the nosebleed seats of heaven are full all the way to the top, full of people that have already run their race, testifying, shouting to you and to me, we've done it, so can you, which, which is a great motivation that we can get through this life and we can be, like the Bible says, more than conquerors in this life that God has for us. And so as we go to Hebrews in the 12th chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, let's look at it again as we go line upon line, precept upon precept. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud or crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And today I want to focus in on the next segment of that verse as we talk about running the race, part number two today. As the author of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. There's so many things in life that we get tripped up on, that we get stuck on, that we get wrapped up in, that impedes our forward progress. And today I want to talk about one of those things that the Bible talks about. It's very interesting that so often we think about, and it's logic and it's common sense, that we say, you know what, we have to get rid of that sin and stop doing the things that once separated us from God, that sin nature. You know, the Bible has some very clear things to say, you should not do this any longer. Those that, that do this and those that do this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we understand that we need to take time in our lives to set aside the sin of our lives because we're no longer in that sin nature through the grace of God. Now we have a new nature, a new body, a new, we are a new creation. So the Bible speaks to us up and so we can live in this new body or this new mindset that Jesus Christ has given to us. But on the same time, the Bible clearly defines that there is something other than sin that we in our lives have to lay aside. And that's why he says, let us lay aside the weight and sin, not the weight of sin, but weight and sin. Meaning that there are two completely separate categories of things in our lives that we are to lay aside or set aside of or no longer hold on to in life. I mean, think about it like this. As they paint this picture of this great race, they, they paint this picture setting you and I up as, as athletes in the stadium. You know, if you, you never thought you would ever accomplish anything, the Bible paints a picture that you are the next Usain Bolt. The greatest of all time. Now, that's you right now. Heaven is shouting for you. And there you are at the track and field meet ready to run. And, and if you look at the imagery here that they're painting, it says, let us lay aside every weight and sin. The athletes 
understand exactly what this statement means. Why? Because if you've ever seen athletes training, I know as I talked last week that Stacy and I were like Olympic fanatics, and so we're watching all the Olympics. We recorded everything. I, I, I could care less about equestrian horse jumping unless it's every four years, and I'm like, wow, look at that horse. Look at the lines, and, and, and then swimming, and, and then the walking one. That is just so captivating to watch somebody walk almost 100 miles. Wow. And we're just on the edge of our seat watching all of it. My favorite part about the Olympics is all the backstories, you know, the, the stories of how this certain Olympian, how this certain athlete, they, they shouldn't have made it, and, and they had an injury that was debilitating, and, and then they showed them, and then, then there's Matt Lauer or somebody, and they're sitting in the chair, and they're talking about, how did you come back? And they talk about training, and then they cut away to the training. And it was so neat to watch all the different ways in which these athletes train. I think about Michael Phelps, who's, you know, the greatest Olympian of, in, in history, 22 gold medals. Nobody even comes close to that. And they were showing how Michael Phelps got into, into shape coming back into this, this Olympics, you know, after having a, a disappointing London Olympics. And they showed that he was swimming. And when he was swimming in the pool, he had this parachute type thing attached to his shoulder. So every time he would swim, it caused drag and it caused resistance. I was watching another article about Allison Felix, the, the United States female runner. They were showing her run and they had these, she had these big rubber bands around her legs and so she had to do these big strides with these rubber bands and she's stretching all these different ligaments and all these different parts of her body that normally just running wouldn't do. And so athletes understand exactly what's being said here is that there's a, there's a sense of training that oftentimes athletes, they'll run with weights around their legs or they'll run with, uh, runners oftentimes will run with vests that are laden down with weight or, or swimmers will swim with things that cause drag in the water to cause resistance to build up their strength. But an athlete would never in a million years dream of running their race with their weight. Why? Because what is weight? I mean, think about it for a moment. What is weight? Weight is that which holds us down. It's heavy. It bogs us down. And so here the author of Hebrews is painting this picture that there's weights in our life that hold us down, that keep us back. And he says, when it's time now for you and I to step into the arena of life that all of heaven is rooting us on and God has laid out a course in our direction and for our lives, now the author of Hebrews says to you and I, we have got to lay aside, shed the weight, that we have been carrying and run the race that God has set before us. When you think about a race, what is the most important thing in a race? There's all sorts of different answers. Everybody's mumbling, not sure which one because I always trick you with these questions. The most important thing in a race is time. The first person to cross the finish line wins. It doesn't matter if you win by 0 .05 milliseconds or you win by 50 seconds. Time is the most important factor in a race. That's why they've invested so much money and so much our resources into showing times. If you ever watch an Olympian, if you've ever watched a track and field race or swim meet, the moment they touch that wall, the moment they cross that finish line, they're not looking at the crowd. What are they looking at? They're looking at the time board to see what their time was, because oftentimes they're racing against their previous or best times. You know, the Bible tells us, Job had this understanding as, as he was going through immense trials and tribulations in his life, the Bible tells us that God has your minutes and your months numbered. That God knows exactly the, d the determination of your days, and he has appointed limits in your life that you cannot pass. God knows in your life the very last moment and the very first moment. He knows the beginning and the end point of your life. You have a set determined time in your life. Therefore, when you watch movies like Final Destination, you don't have to worry about death creeping at your door because you missed it. Why? God has your days determined. He knows exactly how long in your life you are going to live. Which means that you and I have a race that is set before us and that means it's not a suggestion for followers of Jesus. It's not a good idea for you and I who profess to be disciples and, and Christians. It, it's not just something that we ought to do. It is a mandate that you and I run our race well. Why? Because our days are determined. Our months are numbered. Our limitations have been set by God. And God says time is the most important factor in any race. And if you are running a race for Jesus Christ, you have got to run that race the best that you can. 
Paul talks to a church and he says, you were running well. Who hindered you? And so you see, it's a commandment for us to shed the weight that we live in or that we carry so that we can run this life. This short amount of time, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dan talked about suffering and what it means for Christians to suffer. And when we look at the grand scheme of eternity, this moment that we live is just a second. It's a flash. It's a vapor that, that dissolves into the air when you compare it to, the, to the, the scale of eternity. And so we have limited time here, which means we have got to run our race the best we possibly can. So why would we carry weight? Well, we've heard messages about this. I mean, Hebrews 12, chapter verses number 1 and 2 are probably one of the more talked about verses in the Bible. If you've, if you've been in church for any amount of time, I'm sure you've heard a message on Hebrews 12, chapter. I remember one person in the church was like, man, you guys have finally made it to my favorite verse in the Bible. So there's all sorts of different things. And oftentimes we've heard about what is weight? What is weight to you and I? Well, oftentimes we hear that weight is the offenses that we've dealt with, the bitterness that we carry, the frustration or the anger, the things that we hold on to in life. And absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, that is weight in our lives. But today I wanted to talk to you about something that maybe we don't often consider as weight. Maybe, uh, if, if you, if maybe you can understand what I'm talking about. When, when you first came to Jesus, and if you haven't done that yet, that's okay. We'll give you the opportunity today. But when, when you first came to Jesus, it's like everything started to change. And we get this ideology in life like, okay, I was this way, now I am that way. And the Bible says don't do this, and the Bible says now do that. And so we begin to live life with this mindset that it's black or that it's white. Right? It's right or it's wrong. Like the Bible says thou shalt not, that means do not do it, right? And Jesus says this is how you should live, which means this is how you should live, right? Black and white. But then as we progress through life, we begin to realize something. And I I believe that the more life experience we gain, we begin to realize that life isn't always black and white. That as a matter of fact, life is really shades, of different things. And so there's the black and there's the white, there's the right, then there's the wrong, but then there's also the gray. And I believe in the gray areas, the Bible talks about, you're like, Pastor Luke, there's, there's, there's gray areas in the Bible? Yeah, there are gray areas in the Bible. I believe in the gray areas of the Bible, oftentimes these are the areas that lead to weight that we carry. You see, Paul the Apostle was writing this letter to the church in Corinth, and it's in modern day, what we would know as modern day Greece. And Corinth, I believe we can relate to in a, in a great deal. You see, Corinth in their culture, Corinth and what they understood, Corinth and what they lived in in the time of the New Testament had a culture that would dwarf what you and I live in. I mean, you think that the culture that we live in today is, is bad. I mean, you can't even watch a Carl's Jr. commercial without them selling sex, right? Like, you can't just sell a hamburger, you got to sell sex and a hamburger. Make a sexy hamburger, if that even exists. I don't even know. <laughs> and so we look at our culture and we say, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's like you can't watch a TV show anymore, you can't watch movies anymore, you, 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 can't, you can't go anywhere anymore without seeing all these different things, you know, all these different outside influences creeping in. But you see, Corinth, the one, what they lived in, They lived in a culture, I heard one person say it like this, they lived in a culture that would dwarf the sexual culture that we live in today. And to worship their their idolistic gods, to worship their gods, they they would go to a temple and hire prostitutes and have sex with them. Men were able to own women just for the pleasure of themselves, and when they were done, they could do whatever they want with them. They could do it with boys, they could do it with anything. That's pretty bad. And so yet they lived in a, in a really hard and a really evil and a really dark culture. And here they find Jesus Christ. And now the Paul the Apostle is writing to them, trying to keep them aligned with what they've been given. And 1 Corinthians in the 10th chapter, Paul the Apostle, I'm going to put it up in the English Standard Version. It's a Bible version that I've been reading lately. I appreciate that it's a word-for-word translation, but it's a little easier to read than sometimes the New King James Version. The English Standard Version says, all things are lawful, but he goes on and he says to the church, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. You see, in this church, there was a movement going on. There, was, there were people within the church, Jewish believers, that wanted the non-Jewish or the Gentile believers to follow and to adhere 
the customs and the traditions of Jewish law and Jewish life. And so that means that they would have to abstain from certain types of food and they would have to, uh, you know, not do certain types of things and they'd have to observe certain holidays and feasts and festivals and sort of things like that. Because Jesus was a Jew, they said you needed to follow the Jews. But the Gentiles, people like you and I, maybe you never were born in church or you never raised in church and you come to church and you see all these different churchy type phrases and churchy type things that everybody talks about and you say, I have no clue what you're talking about. Dancing in a river? What? So the, the church of Corinth was very much like that. They're just like, we don't, we don't know this stuff. We don't understand this stuff. And seven years prior... To this being written in Acts, you can read about in Acts, I believe it's the 15th chapter, there was a council that gathered together, and it was the Jewish apostles and the apostles that were called to the Gentiles, and they gathered together and they said, we have a problem. The Gentiles don't want to do what you guys want them to do, particularly circumcision. As an adult, that's just not something any man wants to go through. And the Jews are like, well, you need to do that. So they gathered together and they came up with a conclusion seven years prior to this being written, that the Gentiles, if you weren't born into Judaism, if you didn't know these things, here's what you needed to do. They said, it's very simple, very easy. He said, all you need to do is stop eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol. Stop drinking blood. It's gross. Don't eat things that were strangled to death. And stop having sex with everybody. Okay? All right? Good. And they're like, cool, we got this. That was was what came out of that meeting. Seven years later, you think that they'd have it all together, but yet there were still people trying to influence the church, the Gentiles, to say, no, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to live like this, you need to live like that, you need to do this, you need to follow these rules, and they were having a hard time. So Paul the Apostle sets out to write this letter to the church at Corinth, saying, basically, guys, listen, you need to understand something, church. As a Gentile church, as people who were never born into the Jewish law, you have been given immense freedom. You have freedoms that the people who were born into Judaism do not understand and are struggling with to this day. You want to eat pig? Go for it. Thank the Lord for carnitas, tacos al pastor. Oh, Lord. I've been free from the law of sin and death in Jesus' name. Says, you want to eat it? Go for it. You guys want to do this? Go for it. You have freedom to do these things. And so what happens is the church, of course, when, when you find all of a sudden that you have freedoms, what happens with freedoms? You, you begin to swing far to the other side. Well, I have freedoms. And I've seen so many Christians in my life discover that there are gray areas in the Bible that they have freedoms in. And when they find out that there's a gray area in the Bible, when the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not, and then fill in the blank, whatever you want to think about, And they find out about it. They say, well, because I am free, I can do whatever I want. And I can do as much as I want. And I can carry as much as I want. But Paul says, you have been given immense freedom to do certain things. But just because, and here's what he summarizes his message. Just because you can, doesn't mean you should. So often I hear about Christians, Pastor Luke, Jesus turned water into wine. You know, the pastor at one time preached that you, you, you can't drink. And I'm like, Pastor Luke, I don't see that in the Bible. Gray area. Freedom. Well, Pastor Luke, what, what about things like smoking and stuff like that? Gray area. Freedom. The Bible does say that your body is a temple and that you ought to respect that. And the Holy Spirit lives in there and you ought to take care of that. But it doesn't say thou shalt not sin. Or thou shalt not smoke. Gray areas. There's a lot of gray areas in our lives of things that we can do. We have freedom. And so often what happens is we carry this mindset of right and wrong, of principle. Because we came into a a belief system based on principles, right and wrong. But you ought to understand that everything that happens in life and every decision that you make in life is not going to be a decision based on principle. But every decision you will make in life is a decision based on wisdom. And so Paul the Apostle says, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. As a matter of fact, a couple of verses, a couple chapters earlier in 1 Corinthians the 8th chapter, Paul says to the church like this, he says, listen guys, you've got a lot of freedom. Don't let your freedom trip you up or other people up. 
So all of a sudden Christians say, well, you know what, I've got grace and I'm no longer under the law and the law doesn't apply to me in this area of my life. Absolutely, you're right. Yep. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. Why? Because Paul the Apostle says we've got to run this life in the best way possible. We've got to live in the most efficient, athletic way when you look at it, a race like that. Like to use the discretion of an athlete as they eat. I mean, do you think that the athletes are gorging on pizza and, and oily foods right before a, a meet? No, of course not. They're eating chicken without flavoring. Why? For the protein and the energy. And then when they're done, that's heaven. That's why there's like paradise and eternity. Pizza. Oh, soda that has no calories and has real sugar. Praise Jesus. So they use discretion in their life to say, is what I'm doing right now helping me? Or is it holding me? Is what I'm doing right now helping me? Or is it holding me? And this is the discretion that a tournament athlete will use in their lives. And the challenge to you and I out of Hebrews is to live your life, every step, every decision, every thought, everything you do, to ask that question about yourself. Is this helping me or is this holding me? Is it wrong after a day's work? I mean, you're tired, you're exhausted, your boss has been on your case to want to come home, turn on the TV, veg out for a couple of hours just to release while everybody else is doing something else on the side. It's not wrong. But just because you can, should you? Is it wrong because your wife has been nagging you men nonstop to finally stand up and take a stand to put that woman in her place. <laughs> Just because you can doesn't mean you should. The discretion in your life. Is this helping me? Or is this hurting me? Because the most valuable commodity on earth is not oil. It's not coffee. Praise Jesus. <laughs> it's time. It's time. Because... You can take water and desalinate it. You can cut a tree down and plant another one. You know, you, 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 we can survive and adapt to the different things that we've done to our environment, to our culture, but the only thing you can never undo is time spent. You can never get it back. You, you, you can wish about it and dream about it all day long if I can only go back to this time in my life. It's the most valuable, the most precious commodity we have on earth is time. And Paul tells us, we have a set time. We have a, a set place. God has laid it out. Job had the understanding. Paul has the understanding when he talks about the metaphors of race. Hebrews tells us as well, we have a set race by God, which means we have got to use discretion like an athlete would. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, to the church at Ephesus, Paul says it like this. He says, see then, look carefully, watch how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Look at, that, look, at what he did, look at what he said right here. I want, you to, I want you to see this. It's very important. He says, see how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. He didn't say not as right or wrong. He said not as unwise, but as wise. Don't walk foolishly. Walk with wisdom, discretion. Making, look at this, making the best of the time. Your new King James translation says redeeming the time. Making the best of the time. Why? Knowing that the days are evil. If we look at our culture, and if you look at where culture takes us, culture has a current like a river. It flows and it just, it kind of meanders and it's going in a direction. And you and I, we fully understand, we see it all over wherever we're at, that if we look at the culture of our society, of our world, and if we were to float down the river on a nice little floaty tube in the current of culture, that it would eventually take us to a place that we don't want to be. And it would cause us to do things we don't want to do. I heard one person talking about the subject of culture. Saying that if you don't make it a point to define culture, the culture will define itself for you. And if you don't make it a point in your life, like Paul says to the church at Ephesus, to define the culture of your life to make the best use of your time, your time will define it for you. 
And so he says, therefore, look, watch, live your life with your eyes open. Pay attention to what you're doing. Set aside the weight, the gray areas of life that you can do, but it does not mean you should do. Just because, listen, 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 let me just get off my soapbox after this statement, okay? I'll I'll be done. Just because it's not wrong doesn't mean it's right. Okay, stepping off the soapbox. Live your life with your eyes open because God has set a race before you, a course, a set amount of time, and time is the most valuable commodity on earth. Time is the most valuable thing within a race. God says it's a commandment, it's it's an exhortation, it's an encouragement, it's a motivation. Church, don't waste your time doing things that aren't going to help you. Spend your time doing things that are going to propel you to what God has for you. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was out with um, my my brother-in-law. We were fishing up in the eastern Sierras. We went to a river, and the river was kind of off color. It was dark, and you couldn't see, and the uh, the water was flowing pretty pretty slow and pretty, but you couldn't see much. And I remember I was paying attention up ahead in the current of the river to where I wanted to go, and I was walking. And all of a sudden, as I was walking in the water, I stepped into this deep bog, this, this silty, loose sand, like quicksand, and I went all the way up to my knees. And as I was trying to walk, I was trying to pull my foot out, but the vacuum of, of that bog, of that quicksand, wouldn't let me get out. So how did I, I had to walk up the river by dragging my feet through the mud. It was a sight to behold, I promise. <laughs> Until finally I broke free of that and I started to walk. You see, you don't have to live your life stuck in the mud with things that hold you back, but it's going to take eyes wide open to look where you're going, to look at the decisions, to use the discretion like an athlete as they use this illustration to say, is this helping me or is this holding me? And so simply put, Every moment of your life, you're faced with a decision. You're faced with a decision right now. Do I pay attention or do I not? Do I get up and go to the bathroom or do I not? Do, do, I, do I go uh, with my friends today or do I not? Do I put on this shirt today? Do I not? Do I eat that food today or do I not? Do I have that second helping of dessert today? Or do, You are faced with thousands of decisions every day, every moment of your life. And so simply put, when you think about the discretion of an athlete, here is what... I believe God wants us to do when it comes to living and understanding this gray area of our lives and what the Bible talks about. And here it is. To ask yourself this question. What is the wise thing for me to do right now? What is the wise thing for me to do right now. Now, I did not say, I I love watching Instagram and Facebook, and they come back, and they're like, Pastor Luke, and they quoted Pastor Luke, and they totally didn't say what I said. But, so, I did not say, what is the right thing to do? Why? Because not every decision you make will be a decision based on principle, black and white. But every decision you make will be a decision based on wisdom. Is this wise, or is this unwise? Think about it. There are a lot of areas that the Bible talks about young people dating. Is it a sin? Is it wrong, according to the Word of God, to be out with your boyfriend or your girlfriend at very late hours alone with nobody else around you? No, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not date after midnight. (laughs) But is it wise? You've been drinking, and you're trying to get past that. You're tired of it. Not going to let that hold you back, but your buddies want to go to the bar for an hour after work. Is it wrong to sit down with people as they have a glass of beer and everybody talks about, you know, Monday night football tomorrow night and everybody talks about uh, the, the, the big game? Is it wrong? No. The Bible does. Thou shalt not go to the bar and drink with your buddies. It doesn't say that. But is it wise? Your wife, husband, you're You're arguing. And you know exactly that button to push. You have studied it. You have researched it. You know exactly. I mean, you will bullseye that button. And principally, are you right? Maybe. But is it wise? Guys, men. You got that hobby. You got that thing. You got that that thing that just consumes your time. You come home. 
You take off your clothes from work and you put on your clothes and you go into the garage and spend the rest of the evening in the garage while everybody else's mom and wife are doing homework and stuff like that. Is it wrong? No. Is it wise? Is it wise? On the job, you've been working a lot, boss isn't looking, you know what, I, I, I just, I'm tired, I'm, I'm just going to kick back for a minute, I'm going to take a couple extra minutes on my break, nobody cares, nobody notices, I get paid salary anyways, it's not a big deal. Is it wrong? No. Is it wise? See, every decision you make may not be a decision of principle, but every decision you make will be a decision of wisdom, a matter of wisdom. So Proverbs in the 14th chapter says it like this. Proverbs in the 14th chapter says, the wisdom of the prudent, which is who you and I should be, discretionary type people, is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Have you ever... Think about it for a moment. Now, the question we say to ask is, what is the wise thing to do? And I know many of you, you think about it for a moment. You're carrying around a lot of weight. What is that re re weight called? Regret. You've made that decision that you have to carry for the rest of your life. You acted in that moment. You acted into that, 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 that thought or that emotion. You acted into that feeling. You followed through with what the, the opportunity was at the moment and you made a decision. And many of us, we carry those regrets the course of our lives. And if we would just go back and you're thinking about it right now, if you would have just been able to go back and tap yourself on the shoulder, however many years ago that was, and just say, ask yourself right now, what is the wise thing to do? You and I both know that regret we carry. We call that weight. The weight that we carry, we would not be carrying. And so he says the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Have you ever been in that moment? And I know you have because I have too. Have you ever been in that moment where you have asked yourself that obvious question? What is the wise thing to do? And you knew the answer. But then all of a sudden it's like that little red guy popped up on your shoulder. And was like, but look, look at this. Think about this. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, wait, wait. And the little white guy popped up on the shoulder with the halo, right? You know, well, you shouldn't do the wise thing. Well, you're right. And, and then the red guy over here says, well, you really ought to. And the white, the, the white guy says, well, you ought to. And then the red guy does push-ups upside down and says, look what I can do. And you're like, yep. You've got a point. You're cool. And we talk ourselves out. It's so funny because the easiest person to deceive in life is yourself. Which is so ironic because you know the intent of the deceit. You know what you should do and then you're like, no, 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 I don't know that. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, who am I? <laughs> so we look at these decisions in life and we say, what is the wise thing for me to do? And I believe, I believe, I believe that you have a spirit, you have a conscience that God has given into you, that has breathed into you. You have something that nothing else on earth, no other life on earth has. Monkeys, even though we might share a lot of DNA with them, they do not have what you have. And if you ask this question, what is the wise thing for me to do? I believe that God has ingrained in your DNA the answer to hear. The question is, will you do it? Because asking yourself, what is the wise thing for me to do right now? is one thing. Doing it is completely different. Yeah. You know, I remember, I, I, I'm a 90s kid, right? I grew up in the 90s. I remember in the 90s in youth group, there was this big movement, and everybody, now, now y'all are like, maybe some of the younger people in this place, it's a trip to think you don't know the original, but you know the, the, the remake, is everybody came out with the WWJD bracelet. Remember those? Now, I'm talking about the original ones, not the new, like, rubber band ones. Like, that's not the original. The OG rainbow, hand-stitched, you know, hand-embroidered, WWJD friendship. You gave it to a friend in youth who was sinning. <laughs> hey, brother, I love you. I'm your accountability partner now. WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? I remember going through my life in the 90s. I, I, we had collections of WWJD. They had the WWJD necklace where you can make the beads on a little leather and then do the cross with the beads. Remember those in the 90s? I mean, just like all the, all the WWJD. I remember I'm thinking about it, you know, like, okay, they're offering me pot right now. WWJD. <laughs> what would Jesus do? And I'd be like, well, he wouldn't do it, but praise God, I'm not Jesus. Let's go. You know you did it. 
what is the wise thing for me to do right now? When you're faced with that temptation, what is the wise thing for me to do right now? When nobody's around at home, what is the wise thing for me to do right now? When you're thinking those thoughts or that girl calls again, what is the wise thing for me to do right now? When, when you're on the job and nobody's paying attention, what is the wise thing for me to do right now? Not what is the right thing for me to do today? What is the fun thing for me to do? What is the most efficient? What is the wise thing for me to do right now? And then to actually do something amazing, revolutionary, something that you've never tried before in your life, and to actually do that. To do it. See, Proverbs, I believe it's the 29th chapter. Proverbs says it like this, 22nd chapter. A prudent man foresees evil, and he hides himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. You see, a prudent, a wise person sees what's coming his way, and does something about it, but the simple see what's coming their way and do nothing about it. What is the wise thing for me to do right now? And then do it. And then do it. Is it wrong for you to smoke cigarettes? No, it's not. Is it wise? No, it's not. Is it wrong for you to go to hang out with your buddies at the bar if you're trying to get off of that stuff? No, it's not wrong. It doesn't say thou shalt not. But in light of your past circumstances, in light of the things that you've done in life, is it wise for you? No, it's not. Is it wrong for you to hang out with that girl or to pick up the phone when she calls? No, it's not. But is it wise? No, it's not. And then to do what you know already to do because God has given to you a conscience that gives you that answer when you ask to do it. I was reading this last week, a story of a pastor, Randy, uh, um, not Randy, what was his name? Philip Yancey, Philip Yancey. He was in a car accident on a rainy night and got in a really bad car accident. He ended up breaking his back and his neck. When the paramedics arrived to the, to the scene and they saw that, they said, listen, you've got broken neck and you have bone fragments sitting on your artery. And at any moment, that fragment can pierce your artery and you'll die. And he tells a story about seven hours he sat there on the stretcher, on the gurney, waiting. Every moment wondering if this is the last breath I breathe on life. A sneeze, a move, just the simplest of, of, of movement could instantly stop his life. And he said in that story, he said in that moment, he kept thinking three things over and over and over again. He kept thinking, who do I really love in my life? What have I really done with my life? And am I ready to face what's coming next to me? Think about that for a moment. Summarize all of those questions in that moment of clarity that he had as he waited and wondered if he was ever going to live. Did I do the wise thing in life? Is it, can I be mad at my wife? Can I be mad at my husband because they've been mean to me? Yeah. Is it wise? Maybe not. Can I, can I hold that anger and that bitterness in my life? Because they hurt me and you don't know what they've done to me? Yeah, but it's not wise. So there in that moment of clarity, he realized and he recognized that I've got to take a step back and to examine what's important in my life. And so often what you and I do is we make decisions based upon urgency because we're in the moment, we're in the emotion, we're in that feeling. The opportunity's here, and if we don't take the opportunity right here, right now, the opportunity will pass us by, and we make decisions based upon urgency rather than upon importance. But taking the time to step back in the moment and ask yourself the question, is this the wise thing for me to do right now, is not making a decision based on the urgency of the moment, but rather the importance of your future. Because let me ask you this, when it comes to running your race, What's better, to slow down or to fall? What's better when you run your race, to slow down or to fall down? Only you can make that decision in your life. The pastor can't make it for you. The church elders can't make it for you. The counselor can't make it for you. The boss can't make it for you. The wife can't make it for you. The husband can't make it for you. The grandma can't make it for you. Only you can make that decision in your life at whatever stage of life you're in. Is it better for me to slow down or fall down with what's coming my way? To stop and take a moment and ask yourself, what is the wise thing 
for me to do so that we don't have to carry around regrets because of stupid decisions. Listen, church, you do not have to be blindsided by the decisions you've made in life. Why? You just have to open your eyes. You just have to open your eyes. What am I doing right now? Is it helping me or is it hurting me? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because it's not wrong doesn't mean it's right for you. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us so that we can run the race with endurance the path that God has set before us. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your inspiration. Lord, we thank you for your guidance, your direction in our lives. There are many of us in this place today that we carry weights of regret and burdens of things that we've done in the past that we wish we would not have done. Lord, I thank you this week as we leave, as we depart, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister to each and every one of us in our areas, in those areas of our lives, Lord, that you would help us to remove the weights of those regrets. But Lord, I thank you that you would help us to open our eyes to see that which is coming at us, that we might ask what is the wise thing for us to do, and Lord, that you would give us that answer. Your word says that if any man lacks wisdom, God, that to ask, and you who give liberally and without reproach would give to us in faith. So, Lord, today we ask for wisdom to make those right decisions. We ask for wisdom to make those wise decisions in life, that we would choose everything with the mindset of our future, the mindset of our race, the mindset of our purpose in life, that we would look at everything and ask, does this help me or does this hold me back? And, Lord, that we would run this race with endurance. We would run this race well, that we could enter in to the kingdom of heaven at the end of our lives and we could hear those words we all long and desire to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And we thank you for that. Holy Spirit, speak to each and every one of us in this place, your word, this week, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Hey, listen, before we leave today, I want to just take a couple of minutes. I promise I'll let you out. This is like the mad dash. It's not the mad dash. I promise you'll get out in a couple of minutes. I want to take just a real quick couple of minutes to ask you to do something. We talked about taking that step back in life. To slow down for a moment. And I want you just to take a moment. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians said, a man ought to examine himself. He ought to look into his heart and look into his life. I want you just to take a moment and examine yourself. I want to ask you a question. The question is this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a very simple question. You see, the Bible is very clear. It gives us one of two options. Oftentimes we think, well, you know what? I'm not sure about those. I don't know if I've landed on that. I think I'm going to come back as a frog or a log or a dog or something other than that. And, you know, I'm going to try to do that. The Bible is very clear. You have one of two options. There's no other ways. No other places. And we understand, we've seen it. Life is fragile. Life is short. Life is unexpected. We're all one accident. We're all one incident. We're all one epidemic away from our eternal destiny with God. And I'm not trying to scare you, but I want you to understand the reality that you have a finite amount of time here on earth. And you don't know when that time is coming. So would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? The question oftentimes arises from that is how did you come to that conclusion? Well, Pastor, look, I want to go to heaven. Pastor, look, I'm going to go to heaven, and here's why. Because I hope so. Because I want to. I'm going to go to heaven because I think I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I don't cheat on my taxes, because I give to charitable organizations, because I stand for social justice, and and, and I'm standing in the fight to end human trafficking. I'm going to go to heaven because I go to church. I'm going to go to heaven because I have a cross around my neck. I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and my dad raised me in church and they told me that I was a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Catholic or or a Christian. And I've always lived my life with that title and with that label. And people with that label go to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven because I serve in church, because I volunteer my time. I'm going to go to heaven because I, I was baptized or christened as a baby or confirmed. But did you know that nowhere in the Word of God, any of those, will get you into heaven? Nowhere does it say that you can think. Nowhere does it say that you can hope. Nowhere does it say that you can want. Nowhere does it say that you can attend church enough. Nowhere does it say that you can be a good enough person. Nowhere does it say that you you can go to church or you can volunteer in church enough. Nowhere does it say that if you join the right church. Nowhere does it say that. The only thing it does say is that you and I, all, every one of us, has fallen, sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. As a child... As a baby, nobody had to teach you how to say no when your mama asked you that question and you knew the answer was yes. Nobody had to teach you how to cheat on that test when you were in school. Nobody had to teach you how to steal that cookie out of the cookie jar when no one was looking. Why? You figured that out all on your own. Why? Because each and every one of us, we were born into an inherent sin nature 
that separates us eternally from God. But the beautiful thing is, is that it's not about some, some mental ascetics. It's not some, some ideology about, well, if I do the right thing, if I act the right way, if I, if I go to church enough, that makes me right with my sin. No, the beautiful thing is, is that God came and he brought a solution for you and for me. And that solution is Jesus Christ who came and who died on a cross. And the Bible says who became sin, not like sin, who became your sin, who became my sin in the eyes of God so that we could be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We could be clean before the eyes of God so that we could be in a relationship in unison and connection with God Almighty for the rest of our days here on earth and for eternity to come. And that doesn't come because you think. That doesn't come because you hope. That doesn't come because you act. That doesn't come because you sit in church. That comes because you give and you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. In John, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a man, a religious man. And he says these words, in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Inheritance is, some, is, is for somebody who is in the family. You and I, we are outsiders, the Bible says, looking in until we find Jesus. And when we find Jesus, he brings us into the family. He says the only way you're going to get into the family of God, the inheritance of the kingdom of God, is to be born again. It's a weird question. Or a weird answer. What does that mean? And the religious man retorts back, what are you talking about? And Jesus says this, what is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. And God has given to you a spirit man of you. You've heard that voice whisper to you in the depths of the night. You've heard that voice speak to you before. You felt that emptiness when you knew you shouldn't be doing what you were doing. That was the spirit of God that he placed on the inside of you, speaking to you, calling to you. And Jesus says when that spirit is given to God, he renews it and he recreates it and you become something completely different in the eyes of God, a new creation born again in the spirit. It's not what Hollywood and society has made it out to be, that weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. It means that you've given God the Father all of your heart, all of your life with a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. It's an all or nothing relationship. Listen, it's not about your mental center, your understanding of who Jesus is. You can scarcely go anywhere in America and find somebody who doesn't know about Jesus. But listen, I'll tell you like this. I know all about the president of the United States. I know his first name. I know his middle name. I know his last name. I know the address of the house that he currently resides in. I know the name of his wife and his children and even his dogs. But yet I don't know him personally. I've never been over to his house for dinner. I've never had a conversation with him. You can know all about God and miss the personal connection with God. God desires for you to have a personal relationship with Him. It's not about a religious system of doctrines and rules and regulations. It's about a relationship with the Creator of the universe for you and for me. Jesus says these words in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. He says, listen, I know you. He says, I know what you're doing. I know your works. He says, I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. I mean, it's a shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They'll be rejected, ejected, expelled from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Lukewarm, simply put, you want to put it like this. Lukewarm is you're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of in limbo. Riding the fence, not, not doing the, the things that you know that you should be doing, but doing the things that you know you want to be doing. And you're kind of right there in the middle. And, and, and there's that constant pull to both the t- directions, and occasional church attendance and a token prayer. But then you go and do your own thing. Listen, let me love you enough and respect you enough to tell you the truth today. You're not going to make it with that type of a mindset, with that type of a life. Why? Because God did not send his only begotten son to die on a cross so that you can live life the way you want to live it. And everything's good and fine and dandy. He sent Jesus to die on a cross so that you could find life through him. And so it comes through a response, through an answer to Jesus Christ. The question for you today is, will you respond? You see, I believe right now that the Spirit of God is speaking to you. He's asking you, are you going to respond? In those very same scriptures in Revelation, Jesus follows up by saying these words. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, will you open the door? And if you'll open the door, he says, I will come in. I will dine with you. I'll be with you and you'll be with me. We'll be connected in a relationship together. Wherever you're at in this place and whatever walk of life you're in, I believe right now there are those of you that if you take that step back in life and you take a moment to examine your heart, you'll hear the knock of the Holy Spirit saying, will you respond to me today? Will you respond to me today? And here's what we're going to do. I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ.
like any gift, you have a choice to receive it or to reject it. God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. So often I hear people, especially of the conservative nature, say, well, if God wants me, he'll take me. God wanted you so much, he sent Jesus to die for you. Now, will you respond to that invitation? It's your choice. You are the master of your own destiny. And you can make that and take that decision today. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, that's me today. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Here's what we're going to do. Right after that, we're all going to pray a prayer of salvation together. And what you're doing is you're saying, you know what, I want to pray a prayer of salvation to give my heart and to give my life to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he said, I will deny you before his father. The decision's yours, yours alone. If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. This is your time. If you're not sure, listen, don't walk around. The Bible tells us, Paul the Apostle uses the illustration, says, I don't want you. God doesn't want you walking around life in the dark, groping about, hoping that you might find the solution. Jesus came to turn on the light in your life so that you can walk out of this place without a shadow of a doubt of who you are and where you stand with God. If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, listen, if that's you in this place today, come on. Quit messing around. Quit playing games. Let's go forward for God today in your life. You've had doctors and dentist appointments today. It's a divine appointment. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do in order to honor and respect that person next to you. And I want to give you the gift of intimacy with God. So I'm going to ask you to do something on a little bit unorthodox and a little bit unusual. And I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes. Just bow your heads. Everybody in this place, close your eyes and bow your heads for the person next to you to give them that gift of intimacy with God. I see many of you still looking at me. Close your eyes, bow your heads. There you go. Take a moment in that to shut everything out. Forget about Labor Day plans. Forget about what's going on, what happened last week. Think about right now, where do you stand with God? Is the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart? And then the question, will you answer? What is the wise thing to do? Answer, the answer, answer, answer. Will you do that today? With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to count three all across this auditorium, wherever you're at. If that's you in this place and you say, man, that's me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I feel him inviting me right now. Respond to that invitation. We'll pray a prayer of salvation together right after that. But let me see your hand. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge you and put it right back down. And we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. If that's you, I see you. I see you. I see you. If that's you in this place today, pop your hand up. I see that hand over here on the side, on the, on the right-hand side. I see you over there. All right, I see you guys over there in the family. I see all of you guys. Awesome. Over here on the side over here. If that's you, raise your hand. Let me see you. See the usher's pointing over here. Okay, I see you guys over there in the back. If that's you in this place, you say, man, the Spirit of God, I believe God's speaking to me right now. I believe he's inviting me. The ushers are pointing over there. I see you way back over there in the back. Cool. Anybody else in this place today? I see ushers pointing over here. I see you. Okay. Anybody else, you say, man, I wonder if I should, come on, if that's you in this place. If I saw your hand, you can put it down. If I didn't, come on, pop it up. I'm looking. I'm waiting. I see you right over there. Okay, all right, ushers are pointing. I see you right over here up in the front, up in the front area. All over this place, all over the auditorium, people are making the decisions to follow Jesus. The best, wisest decision you can make. Anybody else in this place? I saw you back there. Anybody else today? Hands all over this place. Well, praise God. Let's give God a great big praise for all the people that have made the decisions today. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. You're going to invite Jesus Christ into your heart and your life. And here's what we don't We don't want you to do this alone. We don't want you to walk out of here wondering in, in a bunch of gray and fog. Okay, I did this. Now what? We want to equip you. We want to get you connected. We want to get you started off. And so if it was important enough for you to make that decision, it's important enough for you to follow through with that decision today. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have raised your hand. The Spirit of God's saying, man, come on, that's you. In a moment, we're all going to stand, and my friend here, Elijah, is going to sing a song. And as he sings a song, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to grab a family member, look at them and say, come on, will you go with me? Or look at them and say, come on, I'll go with you. Let's go together. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisle and come meet me right here at this altar because we're going to pray together. We're going to change destinies together. If you're in the family room, the ushers will come help you get your stuff. And as we all stand, if you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Come on, come and meet me up here today, right here at this altar. Let's make that decision and change destinies together right here, right now. This is your moment, and this is your time. Oh, oh, oh.
They're still coming. Come on, if that's you, this is your moment. It's important to follow through with the decision you're making. Come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet us right here. Let's change destinies now. Well, I'm looking at you guys over here because I saw you. Look, if you're not going to go forward for God in church, it's going to be a lot harder to do that outside of the walls of this building. It starts by putting one foot in front of the next and making that step of faith to follow Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that together here now. So I'm going to ask Elijah to sing that song one more time. And if that's you in this place and you raise your hand and you should or you didn't, Come up and meet me up here at this place and let's change destinies together right here, right now. Elijah, would you sing that song one more time, my man? If that's you, you come. Come on. Well, hey, praise God, you guys came. You guys are smart. You know what? You listen. You listen to the message today. You know why? Because you ask yourself, what is the wise thing to do? And you know what you're doing? You're making the very wisest decision a human being can possibly make. I mean, that says a lot about you right now. Good job. Good job. Here's what we're going to do together. We're going a little bit late, but I want to pray with you guys. We're all going to pray a prayer, okay? I'm going to ask everybody in the church, so even if you didn't raise your hand, you should have. You can pray this prayer too. But listen here. God does not listen to the prayers of your, uh, the words of your mouth. It's not some abracadabra magical formula that you prayed in church and everything's good between you. God listens to the prayers of your heart. So you can repeat these words right after me, but you believe them with your heart. You confess them with your heart. You say them, or you believe them with your heart. You confess them with the mouth. The Bible says that you shall be saved, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a couple of words. You say them after me. We're gonna go before the Lord in prayer and I'm gonna ask everybody in church to repeat these words after me. So would you guys do that with me? Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, let's go before the Lord. You guys up front and everybody else, repeat these words after me. Father God, I come to you today and I acknowledge that I need you I confess that I've made mistakes. I've made a lot of sins. But I ask today that you'd forgive me of those sins. Cleanse me of my past. I ask that Jesus Christ would come into my heart, come into my life, be the Lord and Savior of my life. I give myself to you to lead me, to direct me, to guide me all the days of my life. I'm leaving hell behind. I'm leaving my past behind. And my future belongs to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit today. I'm a child of God. A Christian. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good job, guys. You did it. Here's what I want to do. See this guy right over here waving at you? Really cool jacket. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Here's what we want to do. We don't want you to leave empty-handed. We want to get you some information, some literature to help point you in the right direction. So you say, I'm running my race. We're going to tell you which direction to start running, okay? That's what we want to do. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. We'll connect you with somebody here at the church that will buy you a cup of coffee in our cafe, sit down with you, get you some french fries for a couple of weeks, teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of minutes. Not, not a big, long program. Not joining some massive thing. Just you're meeting with somebody that will connect with you to teach you some things about the Word of God so you get strong in the ways of God. And you don't go back to life that you're walking away from. If you need prayer, they'll pray with you. And so if you guys just turn over to your left, my right, go right over there with my friend, Pastor Joel.